Welcome everyone to another Conversations in the Void. I am Graveyard Edge, as joined as always with my off-screen producer Salem. Make sure to say hi to Salem in the chat. He is there as our timekeeper and moderator for questions. Uh, I like. I am very pleased to introduce our guest. He has been on here before. It's been a couple of months since on here, but he is the writer, director, producer, and actor of the Hugh Incident. Please welcome back to the show, Ron Chevry. <laughs> Hey, how's it going, Graveyard? Good, good. How about you? I'm doing really well. Hey, hey Salem, you're, you're <laughs> out there somewhere, I know. Yes. Um, I think Salem is actually not a human being, but like a little black cat that's on <laughs> working behind the scenes for you. Oh, for sure. A lot of people think that about him, that he's just a figment of my imagination, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, last time we talked about the Who incident, I had the, the privilege of watching this movie before we got the interview, and I have a physical copy here in my hands Sweet. and we'll get to that later. But I also have it in the link to the description below for your physical copies from not quite reality.com who does great work. Thank so you. make sure to check it out. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So we have some weird and wacky stuff to this, talk about the tonight, right? Yes, we do actually. So, you know, just so everyone knows we're going to go into spoilers. So it's, it's a warning. You've been warned. If you haven't seen it, <laughs> we're going to, Reveal a lot of things tonight. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you want to get into that first? You want to kind of talk about your the history and the weirdness that surrounded the movie since then? Um, yeah. If you if you want to go there, sure, we can get yeah. into that. Um for sure. Um, for anybody that has seen the movie, there's some strange things that we depict in the movie. And don't you know that reality would mimic that and so we had several situations take place during and after filming that oh. mimicked some of the things that we did within our film and uh, to this very day there's still head scratches um two what of those happened? two of those things are specifically anomalies one was a daytime anomaly one was a nighttime anomaly so uh if you're watching the film when I go to retrieve the axe in the barn, I hear a loud scratching noise. I run around and I look in the sky. If you look carefully, there's one bird circling up there. Mm -hmm. But there's also these white um, lights that come in off the side. And uh, at the time of shooting, I kind of noticed a motion. I thought maybe it was some pollen in the air. Mm -hmm. Jan was up on the deck and she was watching while I was shooting. I did three different takes. We didn't realize it in, in, until afterwards, but we actually captured something strange. And uh, there's these different lights are kind of moving uh, on their own course. And uh, it wasn't pollen uh, hmm. because afterwards we looked around and, and I asked Jan about that and there was nothing around. So, so this daytime one, uh, during three takes, I've got two takes that are, that are uh, on the floor that mm -hmm. depicted the same thing. So all three takes had this in it. Then another time, just before, while Jan and I are on the deck at nighttime, just before mm -hmm. we go for a rip around the fire pit, um, there's this blue orb that's in the background. I don't know if anybody thought maybe we put it in there on purpose, mm -hmm. VFX, but uh, even in an outtake, well, in a BTS clip, you can see Jan and I, as we were getting ready to shoot that scene, I noticed it and I say to her, that looks like an orb out there, but you know, don't get distracted. Let's let's get the scene done. <laughs> and we did the scene, and uh, so we noticed it initially, but then we started getting into the scene and the spirit of the scene. We forgot about it, and uh, my, the scene consisted of me running inside to get the keys, and Jan runs around and picks up the camera that's lying down. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just back up the story a little bit. When we were shooting that, like we're running the camera. And getting set up and then we called action so the camera was running well before we, mm -hmm. we needed the content for the scene uh jan sits down in her chair and leans forward and when she leans back you see this blue light pop out of the sky out of nowhere and it's locked in position it holds place and the minute jan runs around and grabs the camera and i even did a tracking a little animated tracking on this and tried to lock lock the picture in mm -hmm. And this thing, the minute she touches the camera, this thing rises and goes up behind the silhouette of the trees, almost like it's trying to hide the minute the camera was moved. So that was pretty freaky. And ironically, I noticed this on film a day or so later, and this was right around the time 
that I was hand drawing a guide of one of the orbs that we do actually insert into the film. So that was like real timely, real coincidental. <laughs> like I believe in synchronicities, but that was really strange. Yeah, that's that's a interesting. So I know that, I know that we discussed. I think maybe off camera the orb and the special effects. You are you know artist and special effects artist as well and mm -hmm. animator. Um, that is interesting. So you have that on footage still, right? Yeah, we still. So that's actually, if you watch the movie, it's in the movie. We we contain that. Uh, we kept that piece, and it's contained in the movie. So mm -hmm. you will actually see the nighttime orb and the daytime one. So now that I've mentioned that, after I retrieve the axe and run around outside, look closely, and you can see these little white specks. There's there's a grouping, and then there's an even brighter one. The brighter one we thought was a turn. I actually thought it was another bird. So you'll hear my dialogue. I say, well, it's not them, referring to two birds because. I thought it was a turkey vulture and a tern up there. A tern is this diving bird. Okay. kind of look like giants, uh, um, giant shit hawks. You know, they, <laughs> they, look like, uh, they look like pigeons and uh, seagulls. Right. And they, dive, they, they would dive into our pond. So we'd see them around a lot. And when the sun hits them, right, they really do glow white. But that wasn't a tern after I looked at the, uh, reviewed the footage afterwards. So, so that was pretty freaky to actually have captured something, a strange anomaly while we were filming a movie about strange anomalies so yeah yeah and, and, and laurel hey, laurel from you know our found footage discord server she wants to know if you've seen any more orbs since um let me think uh no we haven't actually but you know we've seen a lot of things before we even shot the movie uh we had seen one of those what they referred to as tr3b's which are three dots of light that form a triangle Mm -hmm. They're quiet. We saw one fly over the property where we filmed there years prior to that with two other witnesses. It was on a plane path. We thought it was plane. And, uh, and when it flew over, it wasn't directly over, but it was close. Mm -hmm. Close enough that when we hear the planes go by, we always hear them on this right. path. And we didn't hear anything from that one. We've seen others, some other anomalies as well. Not to mention, you know, there was some spooky activity at the lodge for a few years running. And some people had some strange experiences in there around. There's just a lot of general strange activity on that property, for sure. That sounds interesting. Were there any strange odors, is Fairpoint Station wants to know? <laughs> Probably just myself after I was <laughs> in the forest. <laughs> Probably just me, yeah. Uh, odors, not odors, no. But, you know, the owls were very interested in this. So for anybody that watched the movie, there obviously is a connection to owls. With our characters and while we were shooting some of those scenes in the forest at night running around we had hoot owls that were getting kind of disturbed by us and by our hmm. presence and well I, somewhere i'll dig it out sometime i do have some bts of the owls just hooting it up like crazy we had to stop to uh, stop a take so i decided just to keep rolling because it was so astounding that they were they were really close to us then and even during the party sequence we had owls that were hooting out in the bush not far from the fire pit that don't normally do that when we were partying that close. So that was interesting. They, it's almost like the owls knew something was up. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Did the property inspire the movie? Because it sounds incredible. Well, the property, we we always have people delivering mail or parcels saying, man, this, is, this place is like a haunted house because it's set so far back off the road. Driving by on the main road, you'd never see the house from it. And mm -hmm. uh, I always thought, wouldn't it be great to film a horror movie here? That would be amazing. But but the property didn't inspire the story. The story is actually something that's been in my mind for 20 plus years easily. Um, this is going way back to coast to coast days with Art Bell. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a, a guest on, Whitley Strieber, if anyone's uh, familiar with Whitley Strieber. Uh, he's the author of Communion, yep. who came out. So he was an established author who eventually came out with this wild story that was based on real experiences he was having. And as a result, and during writing that book, he and his wife, Anne, collected stories from the public. They, they did an all call and asked for stories to come in mm -hmm. um, because they wanted to validate the experience they were having because at the time they thought they were going nuts, like any, anybody. And so they, they amassed this giant collection of, of uh, firsthand accounts, eyewitness accounts of uh, ET, UFO, alien contact and and the stories were crazy and so going back to coast to coast 
25 years ago, probably, I remember Whitley Strieber telling two specific stories that burned in my mind. I couldn't believe them. They were so freaky, and I've, I've never let these stories go. And as a result, they were mashed in, into two, those two concepts were mashed in, into one idea that we uh, utilized for the WHO incident. So one of them is, um, let's see, let's start with, let's start with Ghost Dad. So anybody familiar with the movie, we've got this situation where we have a trigger object, Ghost Dad, it seems to be around Mm -hmm. something something is triggering him to be there well as it turns out uh, several stories that were written into whitley and his wife about people having um direct contact with aliens regarded them <laughs> yeah bill cosby <laughs> wow that's you got, yeah. you got some old school people here that <laughs> know that movie so so these people had experiences where they woke up in the middle of the night mm -hmm. and at the foot of their bed there were there were grays standing there, right? So your your standard typical grays that people describe seeing, you know, five foot tall, big bulbous eyes, white kind of you right. know, complexion. But with the grays, there's a recently departed uh, loved one standing there, right? Mm. So now, these are several people that wrote in this story to them, and and it it touches on the question like a few questions, <laughs> like what are the grays? Are right. they aliens? Why in that situation were they bringing? Why was a loved one with them? Is that a projection meant to make you feel comfortable, or do they somehow have a connection to the afterlife? Really bizarre, really wild story. Um, can you imagine? It, like not only are you seeing grays in the middle of the night at the foot of your bed, but a recently departed loved one. That's hmm. just mind blowing, and so that's stuck in my mind for a long time. And, right. Uh, then uh, several other stories uh, from that book that I did here on Coast to Coast were uh, retellings of people like pulling over at the side of the road and seeing a four foot owl, right? Uh -huh. Standing at the side of the road in boots. Okay. So everyone's wondering what's with the boots? Well, there's a direct relation to this one eyewitness story. So they saw this four foot owl standing in boots, right? Like, water boots like like you know mucklucks you know right and they rubbed their eyes and looked again now it was a gray alien standing in boots okay so hey. almost like they were creating some sort of cloaking mechanism that would uh make you feel comfortable with a familiar familiar uh scenario but they didn't quite have it right, you know, and didn't <laughs> quite understand us and what was right in our minds. So right. those two stories, we kind of combined them. And um, and that's essentially where, where the basis for the Who incident did come from, directly from eyewitness testimonies and uh, pretty freaky stuff. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Because for the other podcasts that I do, we actually did, a couple weeks ago, we did um, alien abduction movies. So we did Communion, Fire in the Sky, and uh sounds gonna correct me here in the chat i don't remember it um fourth kind maybe no it was the like the incident at lake county alien abduction so oh um, right yeah 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 One of the old found footage uh the yeah. old ones yeah yeah, yeah absolutely it was a, there was a tv special in the 80s and they remade right, right. it like 10 years later as well yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah right. i mean that that's really interesting you know because we we discussed that a lot and you know Laura wants to know too is what are your thoughts on aliens for real? You know? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I've always been a dreamer. I've always <laughs> I've always been curious about uh, cryptids, aliens, ghosts. I've always been that kid in the library going in borrowing those books all the time. And ghosts, it, ghosts, ghosts is such a tag to put on mm -hmm. things that are going on. I think it could be one of several things and. I, I believe that, you know, I'll go on a limb and I'll, I'll say that I'd like to believe that after we're gone, we throw this mortal coil. I think there's something that's not just nothingness. Mm -hmm. I, I like to think that it's, uh, it's a giant pool of energy, that source that we all come from and we all ultimately go to. Right. Um, there might be uh, some reason. You might have some unfinished business maybe to hang around and do or some people need comforting maybe that could be a reason why people feel 
uh, energy signatures of recently departed loved ones around them. You know, it could be them that are keeping people at bay. A lot of times you hear stories that, you know, um, once somebody finally lets somebody go in their heart, problems and weirdness cease to exist. Right? Mm. So, so yeah, I believe, I believe in something if you want to call it ghosts or whatnot, but I believe there, there's some other things. I don't believe in necessarily demons, things like that. I think that's just a figment of, of reality TV in the sense <laughs> that, you know, it's become marketable to say mm. things are demonic and people are possessed and, you right. know, but I believe there are bad energies, and I believe there are good energies as well, too. And, and maybe that could be an indication of, of us bringing to, to the other side what we carried it on, on this side. Um, and some other things truly are sketchy and, and nefarious. And I, don't, I think there's some energies that aren't human. You know, yeah. They don't want to be messing around with. You know? Right, for sure, for sure. Fair point. You know, have you been really married for 20 years? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great question. They're going to put me on the spot now. No, we <laughs> haven't been, but it the 20 was a nice number for the for our characters in the movie. But we're we're going on to 10 years now. I believe did Jan correct me if I'm wrong. She's probably listening to me. I think we're <laughs> you can hear her giggling. That's around we're getting on to nine years, I, I do believe now. So but a uh, fun fact. That wedding cake in the movie, uh, that little topper, the two yeah. little characters, king and queen, that was actually from our from our wedding cake. So, <laughs> oh, nice. So we we brought a little bit of that into it, and and that party sequence was shot on our anniversary night. So technically, it was an anniversary party, and uh, so every all our friends giving testimonials, they they were kind of, you know, they were kind of for real. <laughs> That's great that you incorporated you know, your real life story and put yourself and Jan really into the movie, too. And I think that speaks a lot to it because you know I was worried people having chemistry, but obviously you guys do because you're you're married. So. <laughs> yeah, well, luckily it's good chemistry. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, because I, I don't want to be watching people argue all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what do you think of George taking over for Art? Did you listen to Midnight in the Desert? Yeah, so I remember when Midnight in the Desert was coming out, and that was a rocky situation, man. Art Bell, he he had major back issues for many, many years, and he, and he suffered. A lot of people always thought he was just this curmudgeonous old grumpy guy, but I, I think there was more to Art. Art. Art was sincere. Art was the real deal. I preferred Art over George. Um, mm -hmm. I, In some ways, I feel like George took the show away from Art, and, um, you know, um, the show still goes on. It's not the same, though. I, I right. feel George isn't the type of uh, host like Art was. Uh, George uh, indicates to me sometimes that he's not listening uh, to the uh, guest and uh, really shows through the uh, the pre-written dialogue. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. I have, I've only listened to Art, so I've never listened to George. So Right. And Art was funny. Art was really a character. And Art had some memorable people call in, you know, George's uh, Mel's hole, you know, yeah. that was a crazy story. That guy calling, flying over uh, Area 51. That, you know, they, they were there were planes after him. Like mm -hmm. he had some epic calls, whether they were real or not. Yeah. But but some of the guests he had on, man, 20 years ago, I was a night owl, <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be working the animation uh, late at night, you know, mm -hmm. all the way through. So I'd be listening to double shows of Art Bell every night and. Calls were great, you know. Ghost to ghost was so awesome. Listening to people calling with their ghost calls, and yeah, yeah, I really dig it. It really, it really became a fabric of me, and it, and and it still holds today. I'm, I'm still just as fascinated with all that <laughs> stuff. So, don't mind the kitties; they're <laughs> behind me right now. That's a new addition. That's Bandits. He wasn't oh. when we filmed, so oh. it was just Fozzie back then. So, yeah, and we've got some terrors. <laughs> So with I, with your you know the behind the scenes footage you have with, with you know and you also have in the movie too with the orb with the lights have you ever submitted anywhere or do you ever feel like maybe because you're an animator people might accuse you of tampering with it? Yeah, no. Um, I actually I sent the footage in. If anyone's aware of security, and I'm wearing I'm wearing a shirt right now. <laughs> this guy Tyler on YouTube that he's got millions and millions of, of viewers and. And, and he talks UFOs and, and people send in footage. And we've always dug him. I sent I sent some of that footage in from the movie to him, but I never heard back. It's a busy guy. But um, 
Other than that, no, I haven't. I haven't sent it anywhere. And, you know, there are certain signatures. If anyone ever wanted to take that footage and look at it, there would be specific signatures that you could find if you knew what you were looking for mm -hmm. to detect that it was fake. It was a fraud. And I, I swear to the gods, on my parents' graves, we did not do anything to manip manipulate that footage whatsoever. Um, in fact, you'll see two other um, scenes in the movie where an orb is depicted. That was uh, our VFX uh, lead, Dan Turner, that was animating that. And so, you know, very drastic differences between the real thing and what, what we did on a low budget. So, yeah. In fact, Dan said there's no way we could have achieved that to make it look so in, 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 in the scene with the right. that, right? So. Yeah, it's just, it's just a weird coincidence that you captured that stuff while doing the movie about aliens. Isn't it crazy? It, like, <laughs> I felt like something was interested in what we were doing, you know? Yeah. Um, I remember writing the script on that same deck. A lot, a lot happened on that deck. Uh, inspiration, <laughs> writing the script, shooting scenes. But leading up to, to the film and getting the script down, late nights, I'd have a little light sitting on the deck, and I'd be writing the script, and the owls would... would they were serenading me and and to me it was like an indication that i was on the right path and um, it's very strange very strange connection we had with the owls there during that and things have died down and we do hear the owls around a little bit now but um not like that um and um don't you know that after we were done with principal photography everything was in the can and editing and it was it was being edited probably about three quarters of the way through editing. <clears throat> Jan and I, <clears throat> excuse me, stumbled upon this author. His name is Mike Cleland, right? And um, he was interviewed by, if anyone's uh, familiar with, uh, a local uh, radio host here in the Toronto area where I live in Ontario. His name is Richard Serrett. He's like I call him the Canadian Art Bell. Yeah, and he, has, <laughs> he talks everything that coast to coast talks and. and he had this guest on, Mike Cleland, who's an author of several books. One of them mm -hmm. that he was talking about that night was, um, what was it? It was letters or it was messages, the, the messengers, mm -hmm. and letters to the messengers. So it's essentially people sent in eyewitness accounts to him because he has been studying owls in the UFO connection. So believe it or not, there is actually a connection with owls and UFOs beyond just what I had known listening to uh, eyewitnesses through Whitley Strieber. Um, so we saw this and we saw this talk show. There's a YouTube um, episode uh, you can find where he talks to Richard about all mm -hmm. the connections that people have talked to him about regarding owls and UFOs. And it blew my mind. Now, one of the things are synchronicities that, that are prevalent around these UFO owl connections. We, synchronicities were off the charts uh, leading up to filming and well after filming the Who incident, so much so that days after we had watched this episode, we went to visit a, our dear friend, uh, Patrick, who was also our folly artist, who did a okay. lot of um, the sound work for us in the film. Yeah, he, he had went and purchased that book and gifted that to us. So a week later, we had it in our hands. And I couldn't believe that synchronicity. He had no idea we had watched that show. I hadn't talked to him about it. He's like, I saw this and I thought about it. And I figured I'd buy it. Another bam, synchronicity. Wow. So I actually had a chance to sit down and read the stories. It was spooky. Um, a lot of things described within that book totally echoed some of the incidents taking place while filming before filming kind of makes me wonder if if, if i i had some stuff going on that i didn't even realize even before the filming right and maybe certain influences that that directed me to 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 script this film and and, and produce it as well too it's very strange hmm. uh, there was another connection I, I was going to relate to that oh so there was another experience we had after filming this was really creepy so if anyone's familiar with the with the story with our movie ghost dad calls me dad mm -hmm. calls me sounds like it's from beyond right yeah. kind of staticky well don't you know that jan just started getting phone calls in the middle of the night uh the first ones were around three o'clock 
anybody That's... believes in that being the witching hour. Yeah. <laughs> and she, when, when she, uh, the, the, when she answered the phone, all she could hear was sobbing, low sobbing, like a male, like a man sobbing. At three in the morning, hmm. calling her, sobbing. She was worried it was a family member or a friend in distress, right? Right, yeah. So when she hung up the phone, because that's all she could hear, they called back. And the same thing. So it, it really freaked me out so much. The next night it happened again. Jan didn't hear it, but in the sobbing, because they were sobbing again, I heard my name called, right? And it was just like dad, ghost dad going, Ron, are you there, right? He didn't say, are you there? But I heard a Ron amongst the sobbing. Hmm. It freaked me out. And I was like, Jan, please hang up right now. There's a, there's this guy, <laughs> like I just, I just kind of lied to her. I said, this, this is probably some predator. Don't answer the phone again. If you ignore it, they'll just stop. They'll stop. I had to go upstairs and unwind for a while. I didn't tell yeah. her. And I told her uh, the next day, I said, by the way, I thought I heard my name called. So we got her, we got a call again the following night. Didn't answer. I think, I think we had another phone call and then it stops. There were a few days in between. We got one more call and all these are happening anywhere from three o'clock to five in the morning. Right. Mm -hmm. Really strange. And then it stopped. But that was kind of spooky. And considering we use the phone as a device within the yeah. as well, too. So some strange parallel kind of things taking place in real life. Oh, that's for sure. For sure. Yeah, that's that's spooky stuff. I mean, it makes you wonder, right? Luckily, when I was the couple of things I've been able to be part of, there weren't serial killers going around in the forest I was in. So I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I'm aware, I, that could have been. Yeah, that's that's. <laughs> That's not a good. Uh, that's not a good uh, echo. That's for sure. You don't want that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the alien, the whole alien thing, that was all all part of. It all stemmed from these stories. These mm -hmm. stories echoed in real life, and and ultimately in the story, I wanted to make a statement. So every a lot of people might be asking, "What the hell's with that final scene?" Right? Oh, 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 I have. There you go. Spoilers. All right. So. It is, <laughs> I'm spoiler. If you haven't seen the movie, this, this is going to ruin the very final scene for you if you haven't. So you might just want to close your ears for a second. But I like the idea of introducing the concept that these aliens weren't just little gray, you know, mm -hmm. that we thought they were, but that those in fact were suits. Those were like terrestrial suits that the entities had to wear in order to be on our surface. Right. And uh, depicted in that final shot when Jan and I get abducted, that's the POV, if, 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 if you notice, the camera's still lying on the ground when we go, but Jan goes with her video glasses. So that's now the POV. It's like an unconscious Jan lying on a slab. And we see this light energy form come in. So mm -hmm. those are ultra dimensionals. And yes. that was my idea, it was that these were ultra-dimensional, so they were pure light energy, kind of going back to me talking about source and about energy and right. before life and afterlife, that these things, maybe maybe they've elevated beyond, and we've seen this depicted in Star Trek, right. something elevating beyond physical, where they've achieved such enlightenment, all that, that all they require is pure energy for them. They don't yeah. need physical form. So that that was a big statement that I that I wanted to make, and all this was happening before all this weird UFO stuff was going on with the disclosure in Congress, with all these mm -hmm. strange things going on in Las Vegas, you know, which is just wild, you know. Um, there's I, I believe I believe there's something going on. It's not I don't think they're all fake. Just like Sasquatch, I don't think those are all fake. Right. Hey, Josh. Hey, Josh. Uh, I think there's <laughs> truth to some of some of these stories, and and if there is truth to even like 001 percent of these stories, then that's an aha, right? Like, right? Whoa. So, yeah. So, so you know, since we are in the spoiler territory, without giving away too much of your next your next feature, you right. know, we discussed it off camera. And now we can discuss it. You know, there's potential future of seeing what happens next to to ron and jan right that's right yeah so we're gonna get a little bit more ron and jan and um the principal photography is already in the can for all that we've got a few scenes coming in remote scenes from friends 
uh, we've got a bit of an ensemble that's that, that's within this film too. So this is a follow up to the Who incident. We're hoping to have it out uh, for this fall if we can. Uh, still, sort of an untitled. We're not disclosing the title just yet, but it's 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 a it's a let's see it's it's a meta um, mockumentary follow up to the Who incident. So it's wow. really Ron and Jan and um, post filming while they're collecting data for um, uh, BTS for an upcoming uh, DVD uh, Blu-ray release and weird stuff really starts happening. So isn't that wild that stuff was really happening to Jan and I after we filmed the Who incident right? for this to turn into an idea? It was more than just this. The, I think the Congress meetings was inspirational for me to, to go forward with something I was connected to the new incident. Originally, we had an idea for a three movie, uh, for mm -hmm. a para, para trilogy, I was calling them. And they were going to be three movies starring Ron and Jan that now that now that the cat's out and we can discuss spoilers, um, you know, these were ultra dimensional beings. Right. Came to collect Ron. So the concept was going to be that they were going to continue to look for the right Ron and Jan because the two in the Who incident, they weren't the right ones for whatever reason they had. So there were going to be two more films where they tried to collect two more different Ron and Jans from different mm. dimensions. So it opened up the idea of becoming different characters with a different storyline, but still having twists and turns. Right and continuing on the ultra dimensional story, but that's not happening now. Uh, and we've gone in this other direction and we're going with this meta mockumentary and, um, it's, it, we, we've, uh, we're echoing and, and we're parodying things we've said in the movie and in real life. So <laughs> it's been an interesting undertaking to say the least. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I really am. I can't wait to see what comes next for, for Ron Jan. Like the meta documentary, well, sounds great and interesting. I also like the idea of the metaphysical and the alter Ron and Jan's too. I hope you get to do that at some point as well. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> That's if Jan's on board. I don't know. <laughs> That's a lot of work. <laughs> right. For sure, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, this is this is great stuff. Like, you know. I always love hearing behind the scenes stuff and especially the, the stories that you have for while shooting stuff you noticed, you know, while shooting and also after shooting as well. It's just yeah, uncanny. It's, it really it's is. Very uncanny, very freaky, it's borderline unsettling, you know, <laughs> but I'm the type of person that anytime I experience anything like that, it's like, whoa, that's so amazing. What did I just experience? So I, I tend to look at the positive enlightening side of it and be excited about it. That's supposed to be scary, but um, I tell you, if we're really out in those woods and things are going down, I might be showing my fear side in reality a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the reasons we wanted to swear a lot in the movie to mm -hmm. make it kind of seem a little real. And I know we've probably knocked ourselves out of uh, young viewership, uh, but mind you, these days, the language I've heard from some young kids, it's hard for me to believe that they're, that language is a problem on TV these days, but yeah, for know. sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's been interesting to, to see too, because you know, you always have that, that, you know, expectation of found footage of why don't people just drop the camera and get the hell out of there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Why do you keep filming? I, I like to think that that strap is really tight on my hand and it's just <laughs> panic and I don't even think to drop it. It's just, let's go. Jan, she had the video glasses, so that's a no-brainer. As long as you're not sliding off, they would stay there. But, yeah, like, wouldn't she just drop the camera and not worry about it? But, see, I might be in real life the type of guy that wanted to document it, yeah. Document this, you know? Right. Like, <laughs> we got to collect this, man. Like, nobody's going to believe this, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you always think about that. You know, always watch, like, you know, the proof is out there. Or uh, there's other shows as well, you know, uh, Strange Evidence. You, like... You know, stuff's blowing up and people are just still recording. Like, why are they still recording? Yes. So we, I think it's a real life. We see it in real life. I, I think we should give that more credence in found footage movies because it does happen. Yeah, hey, it's true. And this is why uh, I like certain ones like the the, the Phoenix incident and, and, and mm -hmm. certain found footage films that, and the Didloff Pass, Dilatov, Dilatov Pass. Yeah. They're, they're messing around with, with, concepts of things that really took place and i find that really fascinating 
Um, uh, one other thing I was going to mention too that in this follow up, um, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, a lot of really good friends I've made over the course of the last few years, uh, getting this production uh, done and out there. Uh, a lot of other friends I've made, they they've been making some stellar movies as well on an independent level, and a few of them have been doing some alien movies as well too, and so they're supporting me, and I've I've helped them in little cameos in some of their films, and they're all it's overwhelming how they they just came together and, and helped us out and so we've got a lot of cameos from a lot of people uh most people who are familiar with the indie found footage scene will recognize <laughs> i'm sure i have some idea for that yeah yeah, yeah i think you know all of them <laughs> so that's fun that's really fun uh and it's 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 amazing uh sandbox uh playground demonstration how people can play really well and support each other Mm -hmm. and I love that. Um, it's, you know, after I, I should be really jaded. I am kind of jaded after being in the animation industry for, you know, about 30 years. Right. This independent scene where people are actually supporting and elevating each other. and They're just ex as excited for other people's projects um, and in support of that way. Uh, that's brilliant. It's beautiful. It warms my heart. And uh, I hope it never changes. I hope people don't get jaded and they they they, they keep doing that because that's really important on an indie level, you know. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. And you know, Fairpoint asked something to go back to the animation. What was it like working on Don Bluth's sequel? Oh, <laughs> was there yeah. pressure to live up to the original? Don. So, which one are you referring to? Because I'll tell you what, there are a few there are a few errors on IMDb for me. So. Um, I'm trying to think if I've worked on a Don Bluth. I don't think I've worked on a Don Bluth. Um, I've worked on many sequels. I've worked on Disney sequels and mm -hmm. all, all Dogs Go to Heaven 2, a lot of sequels. Yeah, I, th I mean, that was a sequel to his movie, right? He did All Dog. Yeah, there, there you go, All Dogs Go to Heaven 2. <laughs> exactly. that, oh, there you go. I, I totally, how, how terrible of me. I, didn't even, I forgot that was a Don Bluth film. That's how, that's how old that one is. Yeah, that was interesting, and that was a lot of fun because the the character designs uh, were right along the mm -hmm. very first movie, and you know, lovable, memorable characters like that. Uh, it's great um, to have had the opportunity to do that. Even even the Warner Brothers Space Jam movies and that too have drawn the Warner Brothers characters back in those days in the classic sense in the classic design that was appealing. Um, that, that was really charming. And I think we all knew that we were working on something special that we never have the opportunity to do again because, you know, things should change because, you know, they're not broken. And, and they change designs and, right. and they try and update it. And they try and make things better. And I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of change when it comes to classic characters that have been around since I was a kid. Why change them now? Because they've been doing great up to that point. So the idea that we had a chance to work on the Space Jams, heck, even some of the uh, um, some of the Disney sequels, we had a chance to work on Little Mermaid too. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, well, some of the big feature for the big feature for Disney was Princess and the Frog, right? Mm -hmm. So, so classic Disney fairy tale. I don't know if it's everyone's cup of tea, but for an animator, that that's. That was a nice little uh, uh, fun project to work on because you don't get that opportunity too often. Right. Yeah. So, but I, you know, I, I do enjoy, I, I do have the bug, as you've said before, I yep. do have that bug as well too. Uh, after having made a film, I, I love the idea of storytelling on my own terms and on my own time and trying to create little, uh, little shorts, little films, um, you know, I do have a short coming out that'll be coming out soon too. It's part of a collection that friends are putting out there, and that one is uh, that one is kind of funny because uh, I'll just say the name is called The Witch House, and that one is uh, a mockumentary stoner horror comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of stoner comedies and horror, so yeah. I combined it. So, uh, so you might I think you'll be able to see that coming out this fall sometime, and I'll let everyone know getting closer but so it's been fun to work on different things uh because mm -hmm. I, I do love comedy horror uh return of the living dead you know yes like classic <laughs> classic you know reanimator I, I love when they can throw the comedy in to the point where you're laughing out loud and you didn't expect to be laughing a second ago it's just brilliant uh 
it takes a real uh, a real talent to do that. So uh, yeah, so I've got that bug. I'm trying different yeah. things, and uh, who knows where we're going to go beyond this? But I do like the idea of of fooling around with the aliens because that is something near and dear to me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, uh, I can't I can't wait for sure for sure. You know. You know, on the bug, you know, I did spend, uh, I think, a grand total of eight hours in the car of just Josh and I this past weekend, <laughs> driving to and back from Michigan back to Josh's place. So, yeah, it, it's it's addicting. I love it. You know, um, I know we discussed before, I think, a little bit of states unknown, something that we're working on. And we'll do in the United States. But if we're close to Toronto, I'd love to do an episode of this reality show we're working on and have you and Jan be our, our guests. That would be brilliant. For some yeah. investigation of something. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. That'd be brilliant. Love yeah. that. Awesome. Sure. And I do love that idea that, that you've got to go around because, you know, there are some stranger than fiction, real life stuff and mm -hmm. events going on and that aren't just found footage films. You know? Right. But found footage is awesome too. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're approaching the end of the show here. Do you want your random horror trivia question still? Yeah. Throw it at me. All right. This 1985 horror comedy about vampires which was Jim Carrey's first starring role. Oh, uh, that's uh, was that first bitten? Once bitten. Oh, once bitten. Once yes. bitten. Yeah. I had the name yep. wrong. Once bitten. Yeah, that was a, that was a strange movie. <laughs> and Josh says once film making bug bites you. It's all over. Yes, oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Jan, right. Jan, and Jan's like, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, so before we wrap up, give us your plug as well. Where can people find you? And we'll, like I said, once again, check out the Who Incident. It's listed on the ticker below for physical copies. And where else can we find you? Yeah, well, um, yeah, well, uh, I know you've got it written down there, but the Who Incident is now playing on Tubi, Amazon, Sash Thrills and Chills on YouTube. Um, it's available physical media at notquitereality.com. Uh, Haunted Lodge Productions, The Who Incident, and myself. You can find me as Ron Shibubu, and uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I have a slight presence on and, uh, um, IG and uh, TikTok as well, too. But primarily Facebook. Uh, reach out to me and say hi if you'd like to. I'm, I'm, I'll chat with anybody and uh, ask any questions. Feel free. And uh, we always appreciate the support. And thank you so much, Greg. Here. Yes, always, always a pleasure. On you're welcome back anytime. Thanks, brother. Um, so I'm Greg. You can follow us on all social media at Pod Out at Night. We have a new podcast. We we're Salem. I review horror movies every Wednesday at ComicConRadio.com. Make sure to check out Horror Raven as well, uh, where we're doing interesting films, features, shorts that all fun stuff we're working on. So yeah, and once again. Go to notquitereality.com, pick yourself up a copy of the Who Incident. Yeah. As a lot of people in chat know, I tend to be the first one to get a copy of these when they come out. <laughs> Thanks, brother. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you again very much, Ron. Thanks. Always a pleasure. We'll see you next time. Bye. And make sure to not get lost in the void. Good night. Bye, everyone.